So thank you, Admiral Blair. First, we're going to make it a three-way conversation okay. and then involve everybody else. So Admiral, why don't you sit in the middle? So I hope you all would agree with me that this was really a perfect uh, bookend to what we heard earlier in the day of, on the one hand, the very profound uncertainties and potential dangers of China's rise, assuming that the politics of China are really consolidated in the way that uh, Professor Friedberg described, but then a very nuanced, I think, and, and careful analysis of are we going to be talking about tensions and potential conflicts at the horizon, but not that often actually blossom into full-scale conflict? And that the task of the United States, whether we are considered a Pacific or, or a, at least a semi-Asian power ourselves, uh, is to both manage, prevent, and, um, you know, and try to uh, improve the atmosphere to avoid conflict as much as possible. So um, I think Ming and I will, will just get started if we could and then uh, invite people who want to make a comment or a question to the mics in the back or uh, how we'll proceed. I wanted to just start with asking you to put back on your Pacific Commander hat um, with the just sort of semi-amusing question of do you think it does make a difference to rename the command Indo-Pacific Command? Um, you'll, we noted earlier in the day that even though the website of the command actually has updated itself to say Indo-Pacific Indo Command, this, the map and some other parts of the website haven't yet been, been updated. But to me, it's, um, there was both symbolism, but psychology and politics involved in the decision to th rethink the, the core of the command, um, the, 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 the message that we were projecting in this command. And I wondered if that debate was, had started when you were a commander and whether you think the outcome of it uh, makes an, an important difference or is, uh, you know, in the big scheme of things, not all uh, that significant. To me, to me it was more a um, delayed recognition of the reality. I mean, I felt like an Indo-Pacific commander when I was mm. there, uh, visited India a lot, worked on the India-Pakistan difference with my colleague in the uh, Admiral Tony, or General Tony Zinni in the Central Command at the time, so mm -hmm. I felt like um, uh, I felt like uh, the whole, this whole area shown be behind me was what I was responsible for, and I think uh, Admiral Harris, uh, who initiated the, the name change, thought the same thing too, but thought the name was inadequate for it, mm -hmm. so I think it was sort of less, less a significant widening of changing of the, at least the military focus, than it was the a delayed recognition that this is really what uh, more aptly fits. And uh, generally in the armed forces, we try to get the nomenclature roughly accurate with what the duties are, but it takes some, mm -hmm. take, take some time. And, and, uh, and I think that, so this was a case more of, uh, more of the, the name following the reality rather than some bold new statement of, uh, of changes of, mm -hmm. uh, of activity. And as I think Lee mentioned earlier, the you know even as we meet, there is the two plus two meeting in Delhi with uh, secretaries of defense and state meeting with their counterparts in India. Right. Um, what's your impression of the state of U.S. Indian security cooperation these days? Yeah, it was. Um, It really sort of all depend, depends on India, is, is my experience. Uh, the United States is, uh, is happy, willing, and able to do a great deal with, with India. We, we have a, a generally common approach to uh, most, of the, uh, most of the problems in the region now that the Cold War is, is over. And uh, militarily, there's a lot we can do to, uh, to work with one another. I'd say... Um, the biggest missed opportunity that uh, that we had with India came while I was the uh, Pacific Commander after 9/11. Uh, the we were immediately sending forces, primarily by air, quickly to the Persian Gulf region, and it's halfway around the world from the United States. So you can either go east uh, across Europe and at least, or you can go west across mm -hmm. the Pacific. And the uh, what determines it is. Uh, 
flight times and the logistics, the tanker support along the way. The Indians came to us at the time of that, uh, at the time of that, uh, right after 9/11, and said, "If you want to fly across Indian airspace and go into Afghanistan uh, directly, uh, we'll give you permission to do it." Unprecedented in the mm -hmm. Indian, uh, mm -hmm. and and um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Pakistan didn't want that to happen, and we did not take it advantage of it. So I think we missed a real opportunity there. But there's this continuing fact, underlying fact that the United States and India can do a lot of, a lot of work together. Mm -hmm. I think there's a cultural difference in that the United States, we tend to you know, want to have an ally, want to work with them in all sorts of ways, whereas I, I think uh, Yun said strategic autonomy. The Indians, in my experience, say, oh, yes, we will work with you for a while, but we have other <laughs> interests too, you know, we must consider. And uh, I've heard that lecture so many times. Uh, and but it's 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 true. <laughs> it's true, and it's 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 the current instantiation of non-aligned, uh, mm -hmm. which probably was not so much non-aligned as pro-Indian when that you really go back and hmm. unpeel it. So I think we, I think we have to, um, I think we have to, uh, uh, you know, work with India wherever we can, but but not have this these overwrought expectations, which are bound to be. Uh, disappointed mm -hmm. because uh, India will go where India wants, wants to go and we can move along in a realistic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we had a really a great uh, presenters and uh, one of the uh, issues that came up is what kind of international order East Asia will have. And we heard people that China is trying to create its own uh, uh, international arrangement and exclude the United States. I remember the last time there was a serious discussion about order in East Asia was right after the Cold War ended. Right. Right? And uh, um, I just graduated, got my PhD, I went to a conference in Asia. Uh, I remember someone uh, uh, mentioned that uh, we actually like the Chinese world order. We just want, wanted the United States to be the Middle Kingdom. Right? <laughs> and I thought it was really funny. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that sort of also implies certain expectation. Right? And uh, uh, I'm sure from that person, or people who have similar view, they expect the United States to be de benevolent, not uh, abusive. So uh, my question for, for you, Anmar, is that uh, um, you know, we have talked a lot about what's going on in, in Asia. I think that's great. You know, I'm kind of tired of hearing what's happening here all the time. But at the same time, U.S. is important. Right? The U.S. policy affects all this. So the question here is the relationship uh, between U.S. trade policy tariff policy, not only against China, but Japan and, and other countries, and the U.S. security structure. How, you know, how would all this sort of right. trade policy affects you? Really? There is a concern that uh, this may not be exception, right? This kind of a, a trade policy may continue. Yeah, I'm a strong advocate of complete isolation between security policy and trade policy. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I've, I've seen nothing but trouble when you try to leverage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm leverage security interests to get trade concessions or, or, or leverage trade concessions to get security. For, for one thing, within, within democracies, it doesn't translate, right? You don't go to the farmers of America and say, by the way, we'd like you to cut down a little on exports because we want to get a better base, we want to get another base in Japan. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't work internally. You can't, you can't use it, uh, you can't use it internally. You can't build a consensus that way. So. I I always believed in keeping them, mm -hmm. keeping them separate, and um, and uh, I think that you know the Chinese attempts to use ham-handed economic pressure mm -hmm. for security interests. Uh, Korea is, is the, the Republic of Korea's latest example uh, is a Thad deployment decision, and they they uh, what they boycotted the uh, the company that uh, okay. provided the real estate for the mm -hmm. Thad. I mean, come on, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, all that does is antagonize the Koreans, uh, m make them. So I, I don't think the two mix very well at all. Now, at, at, at bottom, of course, you have to have a prosperous country to be able to afford the resources to build the advanced armed forces. We all, we all recognize that. And at bottom, also, you are not. I think if you're, if you have a strong security relationship with a country, that sets limits on how far you're going to drive trade trade disputes. But within that, those very large parameters, mm -hmm. I think keeping them, yeah. keeping them separate is the best thing. You can follow up. Uh, um, I, I know now you work a lot with Japan. 
and you know the uh, U.S. did not exempt Japan from right. steel and uh, uh, aluminum, and potential uh, there's also tariff automobile, which would be right potential very serious right for Japan and other countries. I mean, uh, and you know, but w I mean, w what's your view of that? Would this uh, have some impact on the alliance, and uh, or the alliance is just too strong? You know, and we'll be able to survive anything like that. Oh, I think it's too strong and it will yeah. survive. But uh, I think, I mean, <laughs> yeah. whenever I felt for, sorry for myself, I would, uh, I would think about my friends who were trade negotiators. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> the most, that's the most, you probably had the same experience, yeah. you know. Thankless, yeah. Wendy Cutler and Charlene Barshevsky and Carla Hills. I mean, goodness gracious, I wouldn't trade jobs with them for, mm -hmm. but I think the thing I learned from them is that it's a movie, not a, mm -hmm. not a snapshot. So. Within the, within the trade area, you give concessions in one area, you gain, you, you think that you might do something in steel. So I, I, think, mm -hmm. I think that uh, what's going on now uh, between the United States and its, uh, and its allies, and, and frankly, between the United States and, and, and China, is this sort of you know, opening salvos, uh, mm -hmm. opening, uh, opening act, and that uh, uh, people are trying to generate potential leverage, gain advantages, which will have to be sorted out when, when you get down to the short strokes. And so um, I, I'm confident in the case of the United States and Japan, it won't go to mm -hmm. some sort of rupture of security, uh, security uh, relations. And you know, the, the people who came before us weren't stupid. They, the, the reason that things are arranged in this trade <laughs> deals the way they are is that that was the best, that was the best arrangement that either side could strike up to that, that point, and, uh, and they'll They'll tug and tug on the corners some more and come out with something, but I, I certainly, I certainly don't believe it will undermine the alliance in a fundamental way. Uh, nor do I believe that either side should pull a security uh, card, uh, either the United States mm -hmm. by saying we're going to withdraw forces, or Japan by saying we're going to deny support mm -hmm. for your forces. That's just, that's just committing suicide. Any questions? From, you want to step up to the mic? Yes, uh, excellent discussion. My name is Andrew Patterson, a PhD student here at Mason. You know, I'm, I'm curious, Admiral, from your role on the Pacific Command and then at DNI, how do you believe China judges our willpower in this arena? Not just the physical capacity that you commanded in part, but our willpower, whether it's hearings in Congress, tweets from the White House, dinner at Mar-a-Lago with missiles going off in Syria. What kinds of factors get pulled into the evaluation of our willpower? Right. My experience is that um, Asians in general have a, are not as influenced by what goes on in the 202 area code as, uh, as uh, <laughs> Americans or Europeans. Uh, um, maybe it's because, uh, you know, a, a 6 a.m. tweet comes about the time you're sitting down to have a cocktail in Tokyo and <laughs> other more important things are, uh, are there, whereas, you know, it's people haven't had their coffee yet in the United States and they're just having lunch in Europe. So I, I just don't find that, uh, that, that this froth makes as big a difference. They actually look at what, what, actually, what actually happens. And when you look at this administration, from the point of view of our allies in the uh, region, about the only real mistake that this administration made has been the TPP withdrawal. I mean, that, that's the only substantive thing that we have done that has just, I think, been completely counter to our uh, counter to our interests. And Japan, quite remarkably, stepped up and said, "Okay, we'll <laughs> we'll get the agreement without the United States, and we'll leave a path uh, if when the United States changes its mind, as most of us hope we will." Uh, someday to uh, to get back into that organization, perhaps even resume a leadership role, although that will be harder. So I think from the point of view of uh, things being done, we've actually done, there's not that great angst in Asia. And on, I think the same thing goes for um, ch countries like China that are com competing with us. They look pretty carefully at what is actually done and slapping large tariffs on, on uh, things is I think more important than whether you give a toast when you're in Beijing, uh, holding exercises in the South China Sea with uh, the Japanese is more, is more important than saying that I love Xi Jinping. So I, I think they're, they're pretty realistic. And 
I think on a realistic basis, the United States policy has shown a pretty good uh, continuity. And the history in the Asian region is, uh, it, it's, it's not a good idea to go to war with the United States. It's really not, you know, you, you, the United States may not do well in the opening stages, but uh, it generally gets pretty riled up and comes back pretty strong. <laughs> and I think most Asian countries remember that. I'm Dan Field, and I'm a fellow at the Center for Security Policy Studies. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about Australia and where Australia fits into this uh, regional puzzle. So I was wondering if you guys could just talk about that a little bit. Right. Um, Australia really punches above its weight uh, and and uh, is quite, quite effective with its uh, diplomacy and with the small amount of military force that it actually has. I would say that the area in which um, Australia is most useful to the United States is in the uh, Pacific Islands and in dealing with uh, Indonesia, where Australia has a much better understanding than we do, has greater contacts, has, uh, has, has much more uh, leverage, particularly after the East Timor uh, operation. So that's the area that I think that we, we operate more or less as equals. In other places, the United States really takes the lead and is happy to have uh, Australia to join us, and Australia generally does. Uh, share uh, American objectives in most other areas, and it's good to have those mites aboard, but uh, but uh, it doesn't make a big difference up there. Jack, you want to go? Thank you. I'm Jack Goldstone here at George Mason. Um, I have a military question. Uh, we've talked mostly about diplomacy. Uh, as you know, China's been fortifying uh, islands or artificial islands in South China Sea, building military facilities there. My question is about real estate for the United States. We lost Clark and Subic Bay. Uh, we have issues in Okinawa. Uh, so my question is, given the vulnerability of aircraft carriers, presumably to greater missiles, what are the physical assets that the United States has or needs in the Western Pacific if we're going to continue to play a major role? Right. The, um, in Southeast Asia in particular, uh, what we mainly need are access to air bases and, uh, and seaports. And, um, and uh, in the wake of that fortification of islands, uh, the Philippines, uh, and this is before President Duterte, uh, offered access to nine different uh, air bases in, in the Philippines. And although there's a lot of sound and fury at the presidential level, at the working level, those, those uh, agreements have not been, been changed. If you ask me as a military commander, would I have, rather have seven islands or nine, access to nine bases in the Philippines? I, no question, I'd take those nine bases every time. Uh, the, uh, those, um, those will be very uh, lonely and dangerous places. Uh, China is fortified if it comes to any serious, uh, serious shooting in that part of the uh, uh, the world. So I think that um, I think that from an overall conflict point of view, uh, they, they don't make that much difference. Um, when it comes to day-to-day -day influence, it, it it means that China can harass others in the region uh, with less expenditure of fuel than if it were operating out of Hainan, 700 miles to the north. So so uh, Chinese ships can be refueled and and repaired there, and they can go out and. Uh, and, and bother fishermen from other countries. Chinese aircraft can fly from there and uh, and uh, keep a better track of what's going on in the in the region. And that has a certain effect. But I think the more fundamental uh, consideration in maritime warfare is what happens if the shooting would start. And in that, in that area, China's uh, uh, capacity has not increased that much by what they what they've done there. As for the vulnerability of Aircraft carriers, uh, the United States uh, developed uh, anti-ship missiles a long time ago. And uh, the, um, you, can, you can shoot a missile 1,000, 2,000 kilometers with no problem, either a cruise missile or a, or a uh, ballistic missile. The question is, how do you figure out what you're shooting at uh, over those distances? So the whole game in long-range missile warfare has to do with uh, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance and counter surveillance, counter reconnaissance, keeping a ambig ambiguous picture uh, versus really knowing what it is you're shooting at and getting a missile out there. And um, and uh, it's still a tough problem to uh, 
shoot a moving, a moving ship, even one as large as a carrier, at that range. Good afternoon. My name is Jim DeCrocco. I'm with the uh, U.S. Army War College, and my question has to do with a uh, kind of a follow-up to the last two. Another treaty partner of the United States has the region, Thailand. Um, the last few years since the uh, coup in 2014, it seems during my trips to Thailand that uh, Chinese influence has been increasing. Our influence has remained the same or declined somewhat. Um, what do you think uh, of our future trajectory of relations with Thailand? Yeah, I think the um, I think your observations are probably uh, correct. I haven't been in Thailand in a couple of a couple of years, uh, but frankly, I think it's uh, the traditional Thai capability of taking as much as they can from whoever's willing to give it to them um, <laughs> at the cheapest possible cost. And uh, without any disrespect to my Thai friends. Um, They've been pretty good at that for many, many, <laughs> many, many centuries. And, uh, and what they privately reassure me, and I have no reason to disbelieve, oh, yeah, we're getting that stuff from China, but you know, we're not going to give away anything important to uh, China. And I, I don't want to lull myself to sleep with that, um, you know, with that uh, sort of trope, which may, which may be, uh, not, not be as accurate. But I think that there is a, a large element of, uh, of, uh, of truth in that. Um, I think that so far the United States has handled its relations with Thailand pretty well after the, after the coup and tried to maintain a pretty strong level of en engagement without appearing to endorse the continuation of a military government in Thailand, quietly encouraging them to return to, <coughs> return to a democratic form of uh, government. And as, and as you know, the, the president says that, that he will do that, even though the, he, he kind of looks in the mirror and he imagines uh, himself to be that uh, civilian, democratically elected uh, uh, leader, still with the same short haircut and shiny core frame shoes, but, you know, he's a, but, um, so I think we sort of have to play, play along with Thailand, conscious of the history that these things, these things come and go, and that the overall trend in Thailand is probably towards more representative government, more sophisticated political parties, uh, and uh, and and stay in stay in touch with them. Uh, so I, I'm I'm not relaxed, but I, I'm not sure I could advocate any strongly different policies. And I I certainly don't think that uh, China is going to have any better luck than any other country, including the United States, had in actually uh, getting um, getting uh, dominant influence in Thailand. They'll do it themselves. Thank you. I'm, um, I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned how you view uh, climate change and impacts of climate change as a, a great security issue in the region, and in particular you called out um, uh, South Asia. And so with the um, large mass migrations of uh, what we call climate displaced in the humanitarian world, um, as well as the, those who have been displaced or become refugees from conflict, what if, if, if the U.S. military is recognizing climate change as not only a threat to our national security um, here at home, but we're also recognizing it in, in the regions where we have our, our commands, what, what is the role, if we recognize it, what is our role in helping resolve that and helping assist people who are um, in fact, displaced. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, you know, Sherry here still, no, but I've talked with her on this uh, subject many times because I've, I've tried to think whether these uh, natural disasters which seem to be exacerbated by climate change will, how those will affect, uh, how those will affect uh, security um, issues. and. I think what I still believe is that uh, generally climate change or natural disasters and the, and the uh, vulnerability to natural disasters forces countries to turn a large part of the resources that are either given to their armed forces or would be given to their armed forces to 
helping out uh, and, and trying to, to deal, deal with them, they should happen. So it gives them more of an internal focus to military, uh, military uh, forces than uh, those countries that are, are not so subject, subject to them. Also, it seems to me internationally, uh, almost all countries pitch in and help when something like that happens. They don't take advantage of it for grabbing a piece of territory in the north while a disaster is going on in, in the south. And I just find far-fetched the idea that, um, uh, you know, Bangladesh, because it's losing territory to the south, will march into its neighboring countries to take more territory to resettle people. So I have a hard time finding big conflict scenarios coming out of, coming out of uh, natural disasters. I see more strain on governments, strain on society, attention of the armed forces, and international cooperation coming out, coming out of those. So uh, the... U.S. Armed Forces are, have, a lot of the, have a lot of the capability to help when, a, when the sort of uh, recovery stage of a disaster strikes, and I don't see any reason that'll change. That's kind of a lesser included capability that you get when you buy your armed forces in, in general. Um, and uh, so that'll, that'll always be there. As far as, what, what's the term, um, Mitigation or trying to do things so that you'll be able to better deal with a disaster when it when it comes. I'm sure there's a term for it. Um, Resilience. Resilience. Yeah, I think I think the United States as a whole should help in help in that, and the military component of that, of that should probably be helping should, uh, the armed forces of other countries to be able to do that, and we do some of that with uh, exercises and expert teams. For example, the uh, the big exercises we have in the Pacific, whether they be Cobra Gold in Thailand or RIMPAC in, um, in Hawaii, always have a disaster relief component that involves, uh, that involves both planning ahead and dealing with the disaster as it comes. So, so those sorts of things do, do occur now. And I think the Department of Defense would be a willing participant in a more focused U.S. policy that would try to assist other countries in, in get better getting ready and, and taking actions which would make natural disasters not as bad should they occur. But I'm not sure I see, would see the Department of Defense leading that uh, effort. I think it, would, it, ought to be a, it ought to be a willing, willing partner. And, you know, we could be sitting here in 2030 talking about, you know, they used to worry about these little islands and things. And <laughs> meanwhile, there's been this disaster across the region, their country, our country, which uh, is completely absorbing us and fighting with other countries is the last thing on our minds because we're just saving our own. I mean, we could be going into that, into that, uh, into, into that uh, era. And if so, you know, shame on us for um, sitting around here thinking about uh, Thucydides when, you know, Armageddon is coming down the pike at us. So uh, there, there, there is that suspicion in the back of my mind, but I just haven't been able to think it through in a clear enough and logical enough way that it compels me yet. My name is Alexander Naumov. I'm a student at George Mason University. Uh, so in, in the Pacific region, the probability of state-on-state -state conflict, even if it's low, it's still real. And if that does happen, say, like imagined in the novel Ghost Fleet, which has required reading in many uh, US military universities right now, uh, the US has some key vulnerabilities, like uh, the possibility, well, the really likelihood of losing a lot of very expensive uh, very energy-consuming uh, resources, weapons, platforms, advanced uh, ships and fighters, as well as absorbing uh, a lot of casualties in the very beginning hours and days that have not happened since World War II. Uh, as a, a Navy commander, how do you think the nation and the services should prepare for that possibility? I think we do what we always did, is get really angry and send more of our forces back and build more to replace them and, and clean the clocks of the people who <laughs> did it to us. <laughs> well, on that very succinct <laughs> note, <laughs> I, I, we're going to wrap up. Yeah. Um, we, are, we really do have to bring it to a okay. close. Rich, do you have a really short one? I, we're, we're over time. No, no. Okay. Um, so I hope that you might agree with me that it's really been a very enriching and uh, help, you know, stimulating day. We are deeply indebted to you for joining us with such 
broad and, and deep thoughts about uh, the, the overall security environment in the region, helping us shade a little bit our understanding of where things can go wrong or they can go partly wrong, but not all the way to a war scenario. That's very helpful to keep in mind. Uh, so we're really delighted to have you uh, with us to end the day. Um, there's a lot of people that you can you know, think about when you organize and execute uh, a, a big event like this, but there's only one person I'm going to thank, and that's Neslihan Kaptanulu. Uh, Neslihan is um, finishing two years as the GR, GRA for the Center for Security Policy Studies, and she just did an exceptionally outstanding job in pulling together all the many, many details that go into this conference. So I, I thank you. I congratulate you for the successful completion of this conference and uh, wish you best of luck in your, in your next assignment, unfortunately not with us. Um, so uh, we'll bring the day to a close. And I want to thank you all for staying with us. Uh, Center for Security Policy Studies fellows are throughout the room. They've been wonderful in uh, helping us pull this off. And we'll look forward to another productive year. So thank you all very much. <laughs>